Thank you and good morning. Um, my name is Alicia Gatlin. Um, today I'm going to be discussing a subject that's very near and dear to my heart um, in regards to accessibility and Airbnb's mission of belong anywhere. Um, you know, it's funny, the last time I was on stage in front of a group of people, I was in college studying acting. Um, I actually got my degree in theater. I never imagined I'd be working for a tech company, let alone one as famous as Airbnb or being on stage at a design conference discussing accessibility. Um, and when I was in college, everything was going so well. I was very passionate about acting. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew that acting was my future and that was exactly what I wanted to do. And the passion and the drive, I, I was unstoppable in my classes. I had to slow down and I was overworking myself. Um, and I felt invincible. But things started to change. Um, symptoms that I had been having for a while that had been very intermittent suddenly became very constant um, and very strong. My joints began to swell, particularly in my knees, um, my feet hurt so bad, I had a hard time walking. Um, I was fatigued constantly. I had a low grade fever and eventually led to a butterfly rash across my face as well. Generally, I denied that anything was wrong with me. And there were a lot of other reasons that I could be experiencing these symptoms. I was a barista at that time, so certainly the reason my wrists hurt were because I was making coffee all day long. And certainly the reason that my feet hurt was just because of bad shoes, like unsupported flats like these. There were a lot of reasons because I didn't fit the bill of somebody who would be sick. I was young, I appeared able-bodied, and everything was going fine. So, things got to a head because I refused to go see somebody. Um, and my symptoms became so constant that my knees swelled up so much that I could suddenly no longer, um, I was having trouble walking. I lived in the third story of an apartment building and I was having trouble even being able to use the stairs, um, effectively being trapped in my own room. So that was the point when I started missing classes and could no longer leave my flat that I eventually saw a doctor. We went through a series of tests, um, urine samples, a very large blood panel testing me for everything to try and rule out things like cancer, HIV and AIDS, among many, many other serious illnesses. And then of course, x-rays to review any physical damage to the cartilage and the joints below the surface within my wrists. Um, this is my actual x-rays. Um, from when I went to go get a diagnosis. Um, and I'm sure, unless you're a radiologist, this makes no sense to you. <laughs> it was about that point that I finally accepted that something was wrong. And I finally received the phone call after the review of my tests, and I was given the news that I was diagnosed with severe rheumatoid arthritis. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, if you don't know, is a systemic autoimmune disorder, and it attacks the fluids in your joints that causes swelling, joint pain, destruction of the cartilage and the joints themselves, leading to fusion. Um, so you can no longer bend or use the joints. Um, I can no longer use full use of my wrists because of how damaged they became because I did not go see a doctor. Um, but while it is an incurable disease that I will live with for the rest of my life, it is manageable with treatment. Um, I'm on medications, I see a rheumatologist, um, and it has now become an important part of my life, and it is a large part of my identity. However, at the time, finding out that I suddenly was living with a disease, my life changed in that moment. Everything I once knew about my identity, my body, my health, was suddenly upside down. And the floor came out beneath me. Would I be able to act? Would I be able to draw? Would I be able to live alone? Would I even live that much longer? And a future that suddenly, that had seemed so certain, suddenly seemed incredibly uncertain. I didn't know what to expect. Diagnosis can profoundly change a person, though that may not always be the case for everybody. But in my instance, it left me with a lot of questions of where do I go from here? And who am I now? Which leads to a bigger question that I suddenly had to face my, uh, with myself. Am I disabled? 
and led me down a road that um, brought me here. So what does it mean to be disabled? Um, it comes with a lot of connotations. Um, being disabled, usually in media depictions, it, we often treat disabled bodies as objects of pity and sometimes even ridicule. Um, identifying as disabled is um, a best, was best for me, and it's not right for everybody. Um, for me, I was able to find a lot of strength in the community um, by identifying as being disabled. But what does it actually mean? And there are a few schools of thought on what it means to be disabled and what disability is. Um, first, we start with uh, disability as a spectrum can involve a lot of different things. There is the medical model of disability, um, and this arises from biomedical perceptions of disability. This model links a disability diagnosis to an individual's physical body. Um, this supposes that disability may reduce an individual's quality of life. And the aim is, with medical interventions, such as my medication, to diminish or correct the disability. Now, this is in no way an Airbnb stance on um, what disability is and is not, but I at least wanted to provide some context to you, uh, particularly since this is a model you will find very often within uh, Western medicine. Different disabilities manifest very differently, and that means different people have very different needs. For example, on here, we could see along a spectrum different kinds of disabilities that you may encounter, um, some that involve vision, hearing, um, and something that can even involve thinking and learning. Mine falls probably within more of the movement spectrum, living with chronic pain um, and chronic illness. I'm sick for the rest of my life. Um, but it can involve a lot of things, and probably more than you normally think when you hear the word disabled or disability. Which leads us to ask, since there's a lot of different needs for these many different kinds of disabilities, how do we create a world where these bodies can access spaces and access a world that isn't necessarily built for us. So what does it mean to be accessible? Because disabled bodies interact vastly differently um, depending on what you need. You may need a mobility aid. Um, for myself, I cannot use certain ladders if my joints are swelling. Uh, stairs can become an issue and I suddenly need to use an elevator um, or curved ramps. It can look very different from person to person and one disabled experience will look very different from another. Um, me being uh, having rheumatoid arthritis won't look the same as somebody else who has rheumatoid arthritis. So with the spectrum so large, how do you design and how do you create an accessible experience for this large group of people. So we're going to move on to another school of thought, and that accessibility ties into a social model of disability. Now, this was a phrase that was originally coined by a um, disability academic, um, Mike Oliver, in 1993. And this was essentially um, added upon and further developed by international uh, academics and activists um, and essentially what the social model of disability focuses on is um, it is more so the way that society is designed that causes disability. And so this mode of thinking focuses on positive changes required in society to create a more inclusive and accessible world. Um, and these are examples of different types of changes we would need society to take on in order to create something more accessible. Um, for example, more social support. Um, somebody that you know, um, perhaps they're trying to move out of their home, but let's say they have a learning disability and aren't sure um, how to pay rent. And social support could look like staying at home, but paying rent or being provided that social structure and assistance. But a medical view of it may mean that it would be encouraged that this person does not do that. Um, physical structures, obviously, is a big one. Barriers that prevent people from even accessing spaces, um, which is why ramps are so necessary, but can be difficult to find. And particularly in the United States, can be very um, inconsistent, we'll say. Um, and then, of course, flexibility. Perhaps you have a disabled employee. Perhaps you can show flexibility by allowing them to work different hours within your workspace. Um, or perhaps even the option to work from home. 
So with Airbnb, we have a big task on our hands. We're in a very unique situation in that we're a platform that connects um, people from all around the world with homes. Um, I, we are in every country except for three, I believe is where we're at right now. Um, so we have to facilitate and create accessibility both online on our website, but also how do we solve for accessibility issues off-site in real life interactions between a host and a guest. So knowing what we do know now about disability and the many different ways um, we can change or the things that we may need to do to solve for it, how does Airbnb address this? So I'm going to uh, change the subject really quick. Uh, all along there's a point. Um, we're going to talk about the refugee crisis. San Francisco Design Week approached us with a challenge. Can we create an installation that would align with the theme question everything. And this challenge led us to create an experience that addresses how bias or our preconceived ideas and assumptions can impact the efficacy of the solutions that we design for our global communities. And so we asked ourselves, well, who can we think of that faces a similar problem? Who can we learn from that is constantly trying to question their assumptions and question their perceptions? And we, since we actively seek out those fresh perspectives, um, we thought of an unexpected source. And with a theme like Question Everything and the state of current events, we identified journalism as a field that we could learn from. So while doing this, we asked the question of ourselves, how can you design for everyone without understanding a full picture? So we sought perspective. The impact of bias in both of our industries for Airbnb, um, being a service that um, connects people with homes, and journalism that reports on breaking current issues, the impact of bias in both industries can have a damaging effect on communities that we serve. So we decided to engage News Deeply, which is a journalism startup um, after we encountered the TED Talk from CEO Lara Satrakians, uh, Satrakian, excuse me, um, on how to fix the news industry. It's a very good TED talk. I'd encourage you all to watch it. Um, news Deeply operates a little bit differently than conventional news sources. Um, their website covers a single topic um, in depth for each site and explores those subjects with a team of experts and reporting on solutions and not just the issues. So teaming up with News Deeply, we decided, how are we going to define this experience? This is a very big challenge. How do you question everything? What, what can we take away from this? So we landed on a content partnership with News Deeply that examined how bias clouds our views around the lives and experiences of refugees, one of the subjects they had been exploring very in depth. And along the way, we had to confront our own biases, um, which was uncomfortable, but welcomed. So we partnered with News Deeply on their Bags and Belonging series, which was created, obviously, by um, Refugees Deeply founding editor Preeti Nalu, and where journalists asked displaced individual individuals what they packed in their bags when they undertook their dangerous journeys in search of safety. And we commissioned five globally diverse narratives um, to use and spotlight within this exhibit. Um, the stories of five individuals named Abuzar, Shahed, Diala, Nur, and Sharif. We wanted the audience to experience their stories intimately in order to dispel many of the commonly held assumptions made about refugees' lives and aspirations and to connect it to a much larger theme. Um, we felt that connecting people with a personal narrative would be the best way to break down those barriers and to change people's perceptions. Um, and the heart of our creative approach was to recontextualize the spaces and objects that represent home as a way to build empathy for strangers and to recognize how our biases limit our worldview. So let's take a look at it. So essentially what we did was we built an Airbnb home in the middle of the conference grounds at San Francisco uh, Design Miami. We positioned the space as a showcase experience that explored light and shadow. Um, there were represented, representative color-coded items from each person's story that were woven into uh, this very starkly black room. 
um, in a way that they obviously stand out and are noticeable, but they're not understood. We place them within the monochromatic space um, because obviously they pop out very nicely and it's aesthetically very pleasing. But the dark room also became a metaphor for the shadows cast by our biases. We asked the viewers difficult questions along the way as they made their way through the space. When you walk into a room, what assumptions do you bring with you? Your bias may obscure your perspective and impact your decision making in anything that you may be designing and working on. So, to provide a counterpoint, we created a second room that was uh, very bright white, um, very stark in contrast, which represented literally shining a light on the narratives, representing clarity and uncovering the assumptions that we had brought with us from the shadow room. Here in this room, the colorful items were suddenly recontextualized with their owners. Um, and shown alongside the stories of the people that they represented. Each refugee's narrative, paired with their belongings, dispels common assumptions regarding the refugee community. The stories encourage conference attendees to relate to their desire for belonging, because we all want to belong, and we all seek community. And at the heart of Airbnb's narrative is creating a world where we can belong anywhere. It's a very universal theme. And we wanted to celebrate diversity while recognizing similarities to the attendees' own experiences. So to move the exhibit space from darkness to light was to also symbolize the attendees progressing from an incomplete perspective to clarity as they suddenly began to see a much fuller picture. And of course, accessibility was at the forefront of our minds when we created this exhibit. We used wood floors and low pile carpeting to ensure wheelchairs could move through the space with ease, as well as making sure everything was designed to be very wide to um, create ease and access of space. We provided transcripts, audio, um, which you can see the headphones um, sitting on the peg against the wall next to it, and braille summaries to ensure that the experience could be enjoyed by all potential attendees, so everybody could experience the story. So moving beyond shadow delight, we didn't want this to be a temporary experience. And our next step was to provide our attendees with practical tools to move from self-reflection to action. It's not enough just to think about these things, it's what you do and how you act upon them that matters. So Airbnb's design research team partnered with News Deeply and they created a virtual deck of cards um, with guiding principles that we hope and create and prompt a change in perspective during the creative process. This toolkit is called Another Lens, and just as it says, it is an experience research tool designed to help us and other designers shift our thinking to consider all perspectives in order to create radically inclusive products. The questions are paired with background information and research that puts in them into context and and suggest specific ideas for action for each question. Let's look at the first one. So the questions are broken down into three different categories. The first one being balance your bias. Ask yourself, what are my lenses? What are my perspectives? Designing something that meets your own needs is easy, and it can be a great way to start. However, recognizing the boundaries of your own perspectives is key. Reaching out and listening to people who don't share your perspective will also be likely to provide you uh, better ideas, best informed ideas. Ask people with different life experiences of your own. They typically know best. We also ask the question, consider the opposite. Who might be impacted by what I'm designing? We tend to surround ourselves with people that are similar to us. That seems like human nature. It's very common for most of us. But many a times, the best ideas or solutions comes, come from the people experiencing the problem firsthand. Um, so we ask that you engage in those conversations and be prepared to broaden your sphere of influence. The final question that we ask in this toolkit are a series of questions relating to embracing a growth mindset. How do I learn from my mistakes? What am I challenging as I create this? Once you have an initial design, ask yourself whether or not the design is helping to move your audience forward. 
Preparing to recognize and learn from your inevitable mistakes can actually help your work be more thorough and thoughtful. We all make mistakes, but it's the learning and the takeaways and the openness of making those mistakes that will make the difference. So we recognize the process of creating this experience would also reflect our own biases and our own assumptions and reflect them right back to us. So we would like to continue to evolve the tool into a global resource, not just San Francisco-based. So we're inviting designers and researchers to contribute additional questions that provide and represent even more perspectives. Um, this is the website. You can go to this, airbnb.design backslash another lens. Um, it is open source um, because we really truly believe that our projects that we share bring overlapping communities and practices together. So it was very important um, that we made sure it was an open source project. So let's shift back to accessibility. So we examined our lenses and we realized that to design effectively, we have to question our assumptions and be aware when our solutions aren't working for everybody. And we recognized that we were not effectively solving for travel issues that our disabled guests were having. We've since had some very insightful and very humbling conversations with travelers and disability advocacy groups within the Bay Area, um, where we heard stories, gained perspective, and learned what we can do better. So let's take a look. When you book an Airbnb listing, Somebody puts their house up. You have a bunch of different filters, which these icons all represent, of things that you offer to your guests who come to your home. For example, you can let somebody know that you have valet parking, smoking is allowed in the listing, you have a washer and dryer, etc. We have a lot, and they're all called amenities. But we're going to focus on one specific amenity. Our wheelchair accessible amenity. Let's look at a practical example of this. So let's say back home in Portland, Oregon, I decide I'm going to host a beautiful listing. Um, this is a real Airbnb listing. Unfortunately, it is not mine. Um, so let's say this hypothetical space that I've adopted, I want to make sure that folks know I'm passionate about disabilities advocacy, and I want to make sure that my listing reflects that it is uh, accessible for disabled travelers. Well, there's just that one problem with the amenities. This is it. This is the only accessibility feature, and it, doesn't, it defines nothing. It does not explain to our hosts what that means, and it does not provide any context to guests um, or providing them with the information they needed to find the right homes that fit their different accommodations and accessibility needs. And they also as a guest, lack the confidence that the home that they did select that did have this amenity check will actually be wheelchair accessible. And as we learned earlier, accessibility and disability varies across the spectrum. So one amenity is not a one size fit all solution. So how do we solve for this? Through conversations and research, we've identified a set of features that can make a home a better fit for disabled guests. Hosts now have the tools to be descriptive about their homes, accessibility, the different spaces that they have, and guests will have more confidence and clarity in the homes that they're searching for to find the space that is right for them. So in this case, we break it down into different sections. Um, there, because we also recognized that relegating it to one room or one size fits all model for a home was also what got us in trouble in the first place. Let's take a look at this. With our learnings in mind, we iterated on how guests would interact with Airbnb to find a space that they need when applying the filters. What are folks looking for when they're looking for listings? We were initially using the phrase wide clearance to describe space for wheelchairs to move about, but after talking with travelers, we found that wide clearance is often used for a space to travel. So we changed our descriptions. We went back with that growth mindset um, and we changed our descriptions um, and defined wide clearance as having enough space to access the bed, the shower, and the toilets. By creating prototypes and testing them with travelers with disabilities, we were able to land on a more simple interaction. These new filters allow guests to indicate what they need, what their individual needs are, and 
if, for example, if they need a step-free access to the bedroom, if they need a wide doorway, an accessible height bed. These are all things that guests have to think about, but we were not solving for previously. So with these new tools, we're hoping that this will create a much more inclusive and accessible feature for our guests. I'm gonna go very quickly through the rest of this. So bearing all of this in mind, being a disabled employee at Airbnb, I saw all of these problems and I wondered to myself, where do I fit in here? And I realized that there were other disabled employees working around me, but we didn't necessarily have a way to identify each other or to find a place to belong. So in May 2016, I founded AbleAt, which is an employee resource group for employees with disabilities across the entire spectrum. Um, the idea was that we need to amplify and support our individual and unique voices within the company. The idea behind AbleAt that I had is that I wanted to create community for our employees, and I wanted to provide uh, more education to our other employees as well about what it means to be disabled and what the, the different ways that it can manifest and the different needs for different people. Um, we also are very actively addressing accessibility needs within our own offices. Uh, we can't go out into the public and say they're working on accessibility if our own employees can't even access the building and the spaces that they're in. Some of this work has looked like um, making sure that our doors and our beautiful San Francisco office and all of our global offices, that the doors can be opened with simple door openers. Um, making sure that there are needle dispensers in all of the bathrooms and that this is a global standard to ensure that folks who need to take their medications at work can do so by disposing of their syringes safely without endangering themselves or our facilities crews. Um, we also advocate for better healthcare policies um, to make sure that it's uh, inclusive of our unique needs. Obviously, this is going to look very different in the United States uh, than in Switzerland, I would imagine. Um, but it is a conversation that we do have to have as somebody living with a pre-existing condition that um, prevents me from being able to access a lot of health care. This is a big concern to me and many of my other colleagues. Um, and we partner with other groups and teams, um, partnering outside of Airbnb to discuss with other tech companies in the area, what are they doing to address accessibility? But I would say one of the most important functions that we serve is that we collaborate with our designers to provide a disabled perspective. So who best to collaborate with designers than the employees who know the product, who are also able to provide a disabled perspective on our projects and anything that we are working on. We can point out what isn't working and we can let our teams know what is working or what we need, perhaps bring up things that we hadn't even considered yet. By creating an ecosystem of communication and support, we feel that this helps further emission of more radically inclusive tools. So to wrap up, I have a big question and a call to action for everybody. Involve disabled voices in the conversations. Ask yourself, when was the last time you designed for somebody who was disabled or considered disability while you were designing? If the answer was you don't know or never, ask yourself why that is. Disabled Voices, we are our own best advocates. We can help and we will tell you what we need. Hire more disabled employees and expand different lenses and perspectives while you're designing. I'm not scared of my rheumatoid arthritis anymore. And being disabled and finding my community has made me feel more empowered. And I truly do feel like I belong in a community now. So imagine if your company cultivated those spaces? And what could you do if this thought process and culture were embedded in the design process from the beginning? I'm very certain that if we take into consideration this growth mindset and we involve different perspectives of our own and confront our own uncomfortable biases, we can move forward with creating a world where people truly can belong anywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much for Thank this you. presentation. It was very touching, very yeah. interesting. Who has the first question, please? Hi. Hi. I have a two-part question. Great. Um, how many of your customers would identify as actually having a uh, disability? 
Mm. Um, and then the second part is in what ways, and, and I know you've talked a little bit about this, but mm -hmm. if you could be more specific about, you know, how often and in what ways you've involved them in the product development process. Yeah, um, those are both uh, very great questions. As for the number of users that we have that identify as disabled or having a disability, that I'm not sure. Um, I actually work customer service for Airbnb, so um, I'm not always privy to the data. But what I can say more confidently, I guess, addresses um, more the second question in that um, we have been getting a lot better about this. Um, we're working a lot with disability advocacy groups, particularly within the Bay Area and San Francisco in particular. Um, and they've been reaching out to ABLAT as well um, to ask for more internal um, perspectives as well. Um, there is a task force who were very helpful um, in piecing together this presentation who focus on this solely in creating um, accessible tools on our website. Um, for example, making sure that our site is accessible by screen readers, that there is a correct contrast ratio being applied for colors. Um, and so there is a dedicated team who is working on this and partnering regularly with different um, disabled advocates within the group. Uh, the total number of them, I don't know. Uh, some folks with disabilities choose not to disclose, so it would be very difficult to find that number, I think. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Another question to Alicia. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for your wonderful presentation. My question is, do you, will you feel responsible for uh, describing the accessibility of the, the lodging itself? So getting from point A to the lodging. Say it's up 20 steps. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Yeah, uh, sort of the, the, the physical reachability of, of a lodging of, of a yeah. customer. Mm -hmm. is, is that in any case in, in your focus or, or is that up to... Yeah, this is a, yeah, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, I believe the question is how do we focus on um, the actual hosts and the people who are providing the lodging, creating more accessible spaces. Is that the just a bit? Yeah, yeah. Not, not within the, the, the flat itself or the house, but, but reaching this flat. Yeah. Getting there. Um, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough situation. Um, we're trying to provide more policies and clarity and education to hosts about what these different tools mean, providing them more resources to understand what this means. Um, and with these added amenities, providing descriptions so that way hosts can best identify. Um, we, we certainly want to ensure that hosts and guests have the correct tools um, because it will severely impact um, the experience if they arrive at a place and it's not inaccurately described because we didn't um, tell the host uh, exactly what we meant when we provided a filter. So we've been trying to provide more clarity. Um, and I would say it's, it can be difficult when it comes to the homes themselves because we can't force hosts to provide anything or change their homes. Um, but hopefully we can provide clarity on the different filters and amenities so they can make better informed decisions of what they have and don't have. Another question, please. Since how many years has accessibility and design for inclusion been a topic at Airbnb? Has it been from the very beginning? Mm. Or only since you grew so <laughs> big and have to do it? Yeah. Quote to quote. I would say um, inclusive design and radical inclusiveness has been a core part of our mission since the beginning. Um, Airbnb just celebrated its 10-year uh, anniversary this year. Um, and it's certainly something that we have thought about. But again, with privilege and perspectives comes um, not always recognizing that there are things that are being missed in the design. Um, so it certainly wasn't a situation where we started uh, focusing on accessibility because we were in a situation where we had to or felt pressured to. It was something that began to grow, grow organically um, within our company, um, and particularly a very small, dedicated uh, group of team members at um, the office who spend a lot of their own time working on this as well. So, um, yeah, it's certainly been a part of our mission from the beginning, but specifically focusing on these amenities, I would say it's been ramping up very quickly over the last year or so. 
Then another question. Yes. Uh, so basically, I was just wondering. So you have a platform where you uh, bring together people. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically supply and demand. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to disabilities or inclusion, mm -hmm. do you feel like um, you're getting there? Like uh, you, you have more role which you um, get into where you have to arbitrate between those two parties or how do you manage that? Yeah, um, I, so my specific job within the company, um, I um, am what is called a trip experience agent. So if something goes wrong with a reservation or at the lodging that somebody has booked, I am the person that mediates between the host and the guest. So I have gotten these phone calls before um, where something has gone wrong or something wasn't as accessible as it had been um, advertised. So there is a lot of conversations and working with hosts and guests, which then we're able to take back to the, uh, the company and let our designers know, this is what we're hearing, this is what we're experiencing, this is where we're falling short, we need to address it. Um, so certainly, I think I'm in a fairly unique uh, position from our designers and then I'm hearing the firsthand um, experiences from the people impacted um, themselves, but certainly, again, working with advocacy groups. Um, we're certainly trying to, um, or at least myself, I uh, have no problem shamelessly banging on doors if I feel there's something that we are falling short on in regards to accessibility on the website, but also providing more education to hosts and guests, um, less guests, more hosts. Um, out in a real world setting, because that's a more difficult problem to solve for and a very sensitive one. Okay, thank you very much thank for you. being here, for joining us.